Hi, welcome back. Thank you so much for coming back for our second Making Meaning lesson this week. I'm Ms. Mogelson, and in our last lesson, we read and wrote questions about Keep On, the story of Matthew Henson, co-discoverer of the North Pole. As we read, you wrote four questions about what you wondered about the story. You may have written your questions on a stop and ask questions page, or you may have just written your questions on a piece of paper. If you don't have those questions or a pen or pencil with you right now, please go get them since you'll need them for this lesson. Thank you for getting your materials. Today, I am going to reread Keep On. As I am reading, I want you to think about the questions that you asked and think about whether they are answered in the story. Some of the questions you wrote may be answered directly in the book. If a question is answered directly, it means that you find the answer right there in the story. Other questions you wrote might be answered indirectly. Indirectly means that the question is not answered directly in the book. Instead, the author gives you enough clues that you are able to figure out the answer. When you use clues to figure something out, remember you're making an inference. As I am rereading Keep On, I want you to think about whether your questions are answered and then I'd also like you to think about whether your question is answered directly or indirectly. If you find one of your questions is answered directly, you can write a D next to your question. If you find that the question is answered indirectly, you may write an I next to your question. Please monitor your questions as I reread. Keep on, the story of Matthew Henson co-discoverer of the North Pole, written by Deborah Hopkinson, illustrated by Stephen Alcorn, and published by Peachtree Publishers. The black darkness of the sky, the stars twinkling above, and hour after hour going by with no sunlight. Every now and then, a moon when the storms do not come, and always the cold getting colder and colder. Keep on, the story of Matthew Henson, co-discoverer of the North Pole. Matthew Henson was born in a Maryland cabin at a time when boys dreamed of finding glory, planting flags at the ends of the earth, making the unknown known, and recording their names into history books. Young Matt had that same hunger to explore, but most folks would have laughed at his dreams. For Matt was born in 1866, just after the Civil War, a time when poor black boys like him had few chances to roam the next county to say nothing of another country, the Seven Seas, or the top of the world. By the time he was 13, Matt was alone. He set out to make his way in the world, trudging the long road from Washington, D.C. to the harbor of Baltimore. What a bustling place it was. Gulls screeched, men shouted and rushed about, loading and unloading ships of every size. And Matt stood alone, keen as an Arctic fox, eager to pounce on any chance he could find. Remember, these are the words of Matthew Henson in his autobiography. I shipped as a cabin boy on board a vessel bound for China. After my first voyage, I became an able-bodied seaman sailing to China, Japan, North Africa, Spain, France, and through the Black Sea to Southern Russia. Matt spied the Katie Hines, a three-masted vessel so sharp and bright she seemed like a star gliding on water. And when he spotted her proud, white-haired captain, Matt begged for a chance to go to sea. 
It was breaking the rules to let a boy under 15 sail, but that old sea dog took a liking to him, and Matthew Alexander Henson became his cabin boy. For the next five years, Matt's school was the world, his classroom the boat. Captain Childs taught him history and mathematics, and Matt could navigate by the stars, tie sailor's knots, and fix or build almost anything. After Captain Childs died, Matt left the sea, unsure of his course. He was working in a store in Washington, D.C., when a naval engineer named Robert E. Perry came looking for a hat and found an assistant besides. Matt proved so able that Perry asked him to join his next expedition to Greenland. Soon Matt realized Perry's heart was set on one goal, to be the first to stand at the top of the world. But the pole was not an easy prize, and Perry and Matt had much to learn about the harsh, cold north. Matt studied with new teachers now, the Inuit. Of all the explorers who entered their world, Matt was their favorite. They gave him the nickname Mari Pollock, Matthew, the kind one. I have come to love these people. I know every man, woman, and child in their tribe. They are my friends, and they regard me as theirs. Matt took the time to listen, to learn their language, to make friends. He studied how to build and drive a dog sledge and how to dress and hunt in order to survive. Hardworking, skilled, and kind, Matt Henson earned the respect of all. Eight days out and not a shot, not a sight of game, nothing. The night is coming quickly, the long months of darkness, of quiet and cold, that in spite of my years of experience, I can never get used to. Through the years of struggle and heartbreak, the explorers faced furious storms, shifting ice, and always, always the unrelenting, desperate cold. On Perry's 1906 expedition, he and Matt set a record, reaching farther north than anyone had before. But storms forced them back, the top of the world still out of reach, nearly 200 miles away. The wind would find the tiniest opening in our clothing and pierce us with the force of driving needles. Our hoods froze to our growing beards, and when we halted, we had to break away the ice that had been formed. Perry was determined to make one final try. And so, on July 6, 1908, Perry's team of explorers set sail again on the Roosevelt, a ship so strong it could push through the Arctic ice. They spent the winter locked in the frozen sea, readying sledges, supplies, food, stoves, and more than 200 dogs. They hauled everything by dog sledge to the northernmost tip of Elsinore Island. From this base camp, they would launch Perry's last attempt for the pole. The dogs were double fed and we put a good meal inside ourselves before turning in on the night of February 28, 1909. The next morning was to be our launching and we went to sleep full of the thought of what was before us. Day and night were the same. My thoughts were on going and getting forward and on nothing else. Traveling was slow, and the dogs became demons, at one time sullen and stubborn, then wildly excited and savage. On March 1st, 1909, Perry and Henson's teams set out across the frozen polar sea. Over endless ridges of sharp, drifting ice, 
aiming for one point on the ice at the top of the world, 413 miles away. Perry's plan used support teams of men and dogs to break the trail, build igloos and haul and cache supplies, inching the assault forward day by day. But there were only enough supplies for one small team to make the fast and final dash of five grueling marches, 133 miles more. On April 1st, Perry had sent everyone back except Matt and four Inuit men, Uta, Siglu, Ukwia, and Egingwa. For Perry could not get along without Matt Henson, experienced, resourceful, brave. Matt was better than anyone else at driving the dogs, fixing stoves and sledges, breaking and finding the trail, urging their Inuit companions on. Without Matt Henson, there would be no pole. Without the Eskimo dog, the story of the North Pole would remain untold, for human ingenuity has not yet devised any other means to overcome the obstacles of cold, storm, and ice that nature has placed in the way. On April 3rd, as they moved across the ice, Matt slipped and fell through. Cold, killing water closed over his head. Matt could not grasp the edge of the ice with his thick gloves. We were crossing a lane of moving ice. A block of ice I was using as a support slipped from underneath my feet, and before I knew it, the sledge was out of my grasp, and I was float floundering in the water of lead. Then, in a flash, strong Uta was there. He grabbed Matt and pulled him out as if he were picking up a puppy by the scruff of the neck. He tore off Matt's sealskin boots, beat the water from his bearskin trousers, saved the sledge and Mari Pollock's life. And they simply kept on. From now, it was keep on going and keep on. And we kept on, sometimes in the face of storms, of wind and snow that is impossible for you to imagine. On April 6, 1909, Perry planted a flag on a spot on the ice, the pole at last, or as close to it as they could figure. After 18 years, thousands of miles, the thin, tattered flag they always carried looked as ragged and worn as Perry and Matt. For a few minutes, it hung limp and lifeless in the dead calm of the haze, and then a slight breeze, increasing in strength, caused the folds to straighten out, and soon it was rippling out in sparkling color. Three hearty cheers rang out on the still frosty air, our dumb dogs looking on in puzzled surprise. But now at last, these brave explorers could watch it fly from the top of the world. Please look at your list of questions again. I'm going to have you think about some of those questions now. If you have someone with you who you can share your ideas with, please do so. If not, make sure you're, do, you're doing your own thinking uh, by yourself. Which of your questions were answered directly? What did you hear right there in the book? that helped you answer your question. The questions that I'm going to be thinking about and that if you didn't hear our first lesson, you can think about too are, will Matt learn how to be a good sailor even though he is too young? Why does Matt decide to join Perry in this really difficult challenge? Will Matthew Henson ever make it to the North Pole? How will they rescue Matthew Perry. Please think about your questions or my questions. Think about which questions were answered in the story and were they answered directly or indirectly.
Do you have some ideas? Which of your questions were answered directly? What did you hear in the story today that helped you answer that question? One of my questions that I found was answered directly was, will Matthew Henson ever make it to the North Pole? When I reread the part at the very end of the story, where we read on April 6, 1909, Perry planted a flag on the spot on the ice, the pole at last, or close as it as they could figure. That part answered my question. It's right there in the book. They got to the North Pole, or at least close to it. I'd like you to think now about which of your questions were answered indirectly. One of my questions that was answered indirectly was my first question. I wondered, will Matt ever learn how to be a good sailor, even though he is too young? Remember, they took him on when he was only 13. I didn't ever read anywhere in the text that Matthew Henson became a good sailor. But when we read about his time on the boat, we read that for the next five years, Matt's school was the world, his classroom the boat. Captain Childs taught him history and mathematics, and soon Matt could navigate by the stars, tie sailor's knots, and fix or build almost anything. Those clues are all things that are telling me what he learned to do while he was on the boat with Captain Childs. And if Matthew Henson learned all of those things, that tells me that Matthew Henson did become a good sailor. Now we're going to transition to your IDR time. Please remember that as second and third graders, you should be reading to yourself for at least 20 to 25 minutes every day. Today and tomorrow, you're going to continue the work that you started uh, earlier this week you are going to notice as you are reading when you're wondering something, when you have a question, and you're going to write that question down. You have some choices about where you write your question. You might want to use the page inside the learning packet uh, that says stop and ask questions. If you have post-it notes at your house or sticky notes, you might want to use those. We ran out of sticky notes at my house so I'm just using pieces of paper to write down my questions. I already did my IDR for today again, so I'd like to share with you a couple of my questions that I had as I read today. The first question I had happened after I read that in Dragons in a Bag, Jax looked at a man he just met named Trub and he was looking at Trub's eyebrows and found that his eyebrows look just like Trub's. So the question I asked myself is, is Jax related to Trub? I wrote the question along with the page number, but I also thought about what kind of question this was. My second question that I wrote as I was reading today sounds like this. Why isn't Jax proud to share about Ma sending him back from the Jurassic time when his friend, Vic, is so excited about the event? Again, I wrote the question. You can see I even added some to my question after I reread it, and I wrote the page number that my question was on. When you think about my two questions, is Jax related to Trub, and why isn't Jax feeling proud of himself when Vic is, really, Vic is really excited about the event. Do you notice that both of those questions uh, have, are probably going to be answered in different ways? My question about if Trub and Jax are related will probably be answered directly in the story as I continue to read. But my second question about Jax's feelings and why he's not feeling proud that will probably be answered indirectly. 
questions about feelings are questions that we often have to look for clues to help ourselves answer. We are going to be using these questions that you are writing with your IDR books uh, in our last lesson this week. So please make sure that you are hanging on to your IDR book as well as your questions for our next lesson. Happy reading, happy questioning, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.